World Theatre presents The Two Gentlemen of Verona by William Shakespeare with Judy Dench, Kate Coleridge, Dennis Hawthorne, Brian Pringle, Bill Owen and Anthony Jacobs. Gentlemen of Verona. Once more, adieu. My father at the port expects my coming there to see me shipped. And thither will I bring thee, gentle Valentine. Sweet Proteus, no. Now let us take our leave. Wilt thou be gone? No, Valentine. But stay and... Please to persuade my loving Proteus. Home-keeping youth have ever homely wits. <laughs> Would not affection change thy tender days to the sweet glances of thy honoured love, I rather would entreat thy company to see the wonders of the world abroad than living dully sluggardized at home wear out thy youth with shapeless idleness. But since thou lovest, love still and thrive therein, even as I would when I to love begin. Wilt thou be gone? Sweet Valentine, adieu. Think on thy Proteus when thou haply seest some rare noteworthy object in thy travel. Wish me partaker in thy happiness when thou dost meet good hap, and in thy danger, if ever danger do environ thee, commend thy grievance to my holy prayers, for I will be thy beadsman, Valentine. And on a love book, pray for my success. Oh, upon some book I love, I'll pray for thee. That's on some shallow story of deep love. How young Leander crossed the Hellespont. That's a deep story of a deeper love, for he was more than over shoes in love. That is true, for you were over boots in love, and yet you never swam the Hellespont. Over the boots? Nay, give me not the boots. No, I will not, for it boots thee not. What? To be in love. Where scorn is bought with groans. Love is your master, for he masters you. And he that is so yoked by a fool, methinks should not be chronicled for why. Yet writers say, as in the sweetest bud the eating canker dwells, so eating love inhabits in the finest wits of all. And writers say, as the most forward bud is eaten by the canker ere it blow, even so by love the young and tender wit is turned to folly, blasting in the bud, losing his verdure even in the prime and all the fair effects of future hope. But wherefore waste I time to counsel thee that art a votary to fond desire? <laughs> My father stays me. So, come wind, come tide, to Milan. Let me hear from thee by letters of thy success in love, and what news else be tired of here in absence of thy friend, and I likewise will visit thee with mine. All happiness perchance to thee in Milan. As much to you at home. And so, farewell. He after honor hunts, I after love. He leaves his friends to dignify them more. I leave myself, my friends, and all for love. Oh, thou, Julia, thou hast metamorphosed me. Made me neglect my studies, lose my time. War with good counsel, set the world at naught, made wit with musing weak, heart sick with thought. The Proteus saved you, saw you, my master. But now, he parted hence to embark for Milan. Oh, twenty to one, then he is shipped already, and I have played the sheep in losing him. But dost thou hear, gavest thou my letter to Julia? Aye, sir. But what said she? Come, come, open the matter in brief. What said she? Open your purse that the money and the matter may be both at once delivered. Well, sir, here is for your pains. Oh. Oh. Well, what said she? Truly, sir, I think you'll hardly win her. Why? Well, couldst thou perceive so much from her? Sir, I could perceive nothing at all from her. What said she? Nothing? No, not so much as... Take this for thy pain. Oh. To testify your bounty, I thank you. You have testened me. In requital whereof, henceforth, carry your letters yourself. And so, sir, I'll commend you to my master. Go. Go, be gone. 
to save your ship from wreck, which cannot perish having thee aboard, being destined to a drier death on shore. I fear my Julia would not deign my lines receiving them from such a worthless post. I must go send some better messenger. But say, Lucas, now we are alone, of all the fair resort of gentlemen that every day with Paul and Cantor me, in thy opinion, which is worthiest love? Hmm. Well, please you repeat their names. I'll show my mind according to my shallow, simple skill. What thinkst thou of the fair Sir Eglamour? That's of a night well spoken, neat and fine. But were I you, he never should be mine. <laughs> what thinkst thou of the rich Mercatio? Well of his wealth. Uh, but of himself, so so. What thinkst thou of the gentle Proteus? No, no, to see what folly reigns in us. How now, what means this passion at his name? Oh, pardon, dear madam, tis a passing shame that I, unworthy body as I am, should censure thus on lovely gentlemen. Why not on Proteus as of all the rest? Then thus, of many gods, I think him best. Your reason? I have no other but a woman's reason. I think him so, because I think him so. And wouldst thou have me cast my love on him? Why? If you thought your love not cast away. Why? He of all the rest hath never moved me. Yet he of all the rest I think best loves you. His little speaking shows his love but small. Fire that's closest kept burns most of all. They do not love that do not show their love. Oh, they love least that let men know their love. Ah, I would I knew his mind. Peruse this paper then. To Julia. Say, from whom? Oh, that's the contents will show. But say, say, who gave it thee? This is Valentine's man. <gasps> Speed, is he called, and sent, I think, from Proteus. <laughs> he would have given it to you, but I, being in the way, did in your name receive it. Upon the fault, I pray. Now, by my modesty, a goodly broker, dare you presume to harbor wanton lines to whisper and conspire against my youth? There, kiss vapor. See if they return, or else return no more into my sight. Need for love deserves more fee than hate. We be gone, that you may ruminate. And yet I would I had all looked the letter. What fool is she that knows I am a maid, and would not force the letter to my view? Since maids in modesty say no to that, which they would have the proper or construe I. Why? Ay, how wayward is this foolish love, that like a testy babe will scratch the nurse, and presently all humbled kiss the rod. How churlishly I chid Lucetta hence, when willingly I would have had her here. How angrily I taught my brow to frown, when inward joy enforced my heart to smile. My penance is to call Lucetta back, and ask remission for my folly past. What ho, Lucetta? What was your ladyship? Easter, near dinner time. Oh, I would it were that you might kill your stomach on your meat and not upon your maid. What is that you took up so gingerly? Uh, nothing. Why didn't thou stoop then? Uh, to take a paper up that I let fall. And is that paper nothing? Nothing concerning me. Then let it lie for those that it concerns. Madam, it will not lie where it concerns unless it have a false interpreter. Some love of yours hath writ to you in rhyme. That I might sing it, madam, to a tune. And give me a note. Your ladyship can say. Best sing it to the tune of light of love. Oh, it is too heavy for so light a tune. Heavy? The like it hath some burden, then. I am melodious were it, would you sing it? And why not you? I cannot reach so high. Let your song? Oh, how now? Many of you still do. You will sing it out. And yes, methinks I do not like this. You do not? <laughs> no, madam, it is too sharp. And you minion are too saucy. Nay, <laughs> you are too flat. And mar the concord with too harsh a death camp. There wanteth but a mean to fill your song. The mean is drowned with your unruly base. Indeed, I did the base for precious. <laughs> it's babble, some of them all trouble me. Here is a coil with protestation. Go, get you gone, and let the papers lie. You would be fingering them to anger me. Makes it strange. 
But she would be best pleased to be so angered with another letter. Nay, would I were so angered with the same. Oh, hateful hands to tear such loving words. Injurious wasps to feed on such sweet honey and kill the bees that yielded with your sting. I'll kiss each several paper for amends. Look, here is writ, kind Julia. Unkind Julia, as in revenge of thy ingratitude, I throw thy name against the bruising stones, trampling contemptuously on thy disdain. Oh, and here is writ, love-wounded Proteus. Poor a wounded name, my bosom as a bed shall lodge thee till thy wound be truly healed. And thus I search it with a sovereign kiss. But twice or thrice was Proteus written down. Be calm, good wind. Blow not a word away till I have found each letter in the letter. Except mine own name. That some whirlwind bear unto a ragged, fearful hanging rock and throw it thence into the raging sea. Lo, here in one line is his name twice writ. Poor forlorn Proteus, passionate Proteus, to the sweet Julia. That I'll tear away. And yet I will not. Sits so prettily he couples it to his complaining name. Thus will I fold them one upon the other. Now kiss. Embrace, contend, do what you will. Madam, dinner is ready and your father's tame. Well, let us go. Papers lie like telltales, dear. If you respect them, best to take them up. Oh, no, I was taken up for laying them down. Yes, yeah, they shall not lie for catching cold. I see you have a month's mind to them. Ay, madam, you may say what sight you see. I see things, too, although you judge I wink. Oh, come, come. We'll please you come to dinner. Tell me, Pantino, what sad talk was that wherewith my brother held you in the cloister? Because of his nephew Proteus, your son. Why, what of him? He wondered that your lordship would suffer him to spend his youth at home, and did request me to importune you to let him spend his time no more at home, which would be great impeachment to his age in having known no travel in his youth. Nor needst thou much importune me to that whereon this month I have been hammering. I have considered well his loss of time, and how he cannot be a perfect man not being tried and tutored in the world. Then tell me, Whither were I best to send him? I think your lordship is not ignorant how his companion, youthful Valentine, attends the emperor in his royal court. I know it well. For good, I think, my lord, to send him thither. There he shall practice tilts and tournaments, hear sweet discourse, converse with noblemen, and in eye of every exercise worthy his youth and nobleness of birth. I like thy counsel. Well hast thou advised. And that thou mayst perceive how would I like it, the execution of it shall make known. Even with the speediest expedition, I will dispatch him to the emperor's court. I'll bring him to you presently. Sweet love, sweet lines, sweet life. Here is her hand, the agent of her heart. Oh, heavenly Julia. Oh, no. Uh, what letter are you reading there? Uh, may it please your lordship, tis a word or two of commendation sent from Valentine, delivered by a friend that came from him. Lend me the letter. Let me see what news. Oh, there is no news, my lord, but that he writes how happily he lives, how well beloved, and daily graced by the emperor, wishing me with him partner of his fortune. And how stand you affected to his wish? As one relying on your lordship's will and not depending on his friendly wish. My will is something sorted with his wish. 
Muse not of thy thus suddenly proceed, for what I will, I will, and there's an end. I am resolved that thou shalt spend some time with Valentinus in the Emperor's court. What maintenance he from his friends receives, like exhibition thou shalt have from me. Tomorrow be in readiness to go. But my lord... Excuse it not, for I am peremptory. My lord, I, I cannot be so soon provided. Please you deliberate a day or two. Look. What thou wants to be sent after thee? No more of stay. Tomorrow thou must go. Father. No words away. Thus have I shunned the fire for fear of burning and drenched me in the sea where I am drowned. I feared to show my father Julia's letter, lest he should take exceptions to my love. And with the vantage of mine own excuse, hath he accepted most against my love. Oh, how this spring of love resembleth the uncertain glory of an April day, which now shows all the beauty of the sun, and by and by a cloud takes all away. Sir Proteus, your father calls for you. He's in haste, therefore I pray you go. Why, this it is. My heart accords thereto, and yet a thousand times it answers no. Sir, your glove. Not mine. My gloves are on. Why, still this may be yours, for this is but one. Huh? Let me see. I give it me, it's mine. Sweet ornament that decks a thing divine. Ah, Sylvia, Sylvia. Lady Sylvia! Lady Sylvia! How now, Sarah? She is not within hearing, sir. Why, sir, who bade you call her? Your worship, sir, or else I mistook. Well, you'll still be too forward. And yet I was last chidden for being too slow. Go to, sir. Tell me, do you know the Lady Sylvia? She that your worship loves. Why, how know you that I am in love? Marry by these special marks. First, you have learned, like Saproteus, to read your arms like a malcontent, to relish a love song like a robin redbreast, to walk alone like one that had the pestilence, to sigh like a schoolboy that had lost his ABC, to weep like a young wench that had buried her grandam, to fast like one that takes diet, to watch like one that fears robbing, to speak purely like a beggar or a hallow mess. Are all these things perceived in me? They are all perceived without you. Without me? They cannot. Without you? Nay, that's certain, for without you were so simple, none else would. But you are so without these follies that these follies are within you and shine through you like the water in a urinal. But still thou hast not said, knowst thou my Lady Sylvia? She that you gaze on so, ha, ah, as she sits at supper. Hast thou observed that? Even she, I mean. Why, sir, I know her not. I have loved her ever since I saw her. And still I see her beautiful. If you love her, you cannot see her. Why? Because love is blind. Oh, that you had mine eyes. What should I see then? Your own present folly and her passing deformity. Enough, Speed. To make an end, I stand affected to her. I would, sir, that your affection would cease. Last night she enjoined me to write some lines to one she loves. And have you? I have. Are they not lamely writ? No, sir, but as well as I can do them. Peace. Here comes the Lady Sylvia. Oh, excellent motion. Oh, exceeding puppet. Now will he interpret to her. Lady and mistress, a thousand good morrow. The Valentine and servant. Lady. To you, two thousand. As you enjoined me, I have writ your letter unto this secret, nameless friend of yours. Though I was much unwilling to proceed in it, but for my duty to your ladyship. I thank you, gentle servant. It is very clerkly done. Now, trust me, madam, it came hardly off. For being ignorant to whom it goes, I writ at random very doubtfully. Perchance you think too much of so much pain? Uh, no, madam. So it stead you, I will write. Please you command a thousand times as much. And yet... A pretty period. Well, I guess the sequel. And yet, I will not name it. And yet, I care not. And yet, take this again. 
And yet I thank you, meaning henceforth to trouble you no more. And yet you will. And yet another yet. What means your ladyship? Do you not like it? Yes, yes. The lines are very quaintly writ, but since unwillingly, take them again. Nay, take them. Madam, they are for you. Aye, aye, you writ them, sir, at my request. But I will none of them. They are for you. I would have had them writ more movingly. Please you, I'll write your ladyship another. And when it's writ, for my sake, read it over. And if it please you, so. If not, why, so. If it please me, madam, what then? Why, if it please you, take it for your labour. And so, good morrow, servant. Oh, jest unseen! <laughs> Inscrutable! Invisible as a nose on a man's face or a weathercock on a steeple. My master sues to her, and she hath taught her suitor, he being her pupil, to become her tutor. Oh, excellent device! Was there ever heard a better? That my master being scribed to himself should write the letter. How now, sir? What, are you reasoning with yourself? Nay, I was rhyming. Tis you that have the reason. To do what? To be a spokesman from Lady Sylvia. To whom? To yourself. Why, she woos you by a figure. What figure? By a letter, I should say. Why, she hath not writ to me. What need she when she hath made you write to yourself? Why, do you not perceive the jest? No, believe me. No believing you indeed, sir. But did you perceive her earnest? She gave me none, except an angry word. Why, she hath give you the letter. That's the letter I writ to her friend. And that letter hath she delivered, and there an end. I would it were no word. I'll warrant you tis as well. For often have you writ to her, and she in modesty, or else for want of idle time, could not again reply, or fearing else some messenger that might her mind discover, herself hath taught her love himself to write unto her lover. All this I speak in print, for in print I found it. Why muse you, sir? Tis dinner time. I have dined. Aye, but hearken, sir. Though the chameleon love can feed on air, I am one that am nourished by my victuals, and would fain have meat. Oh, be not like your mistress. Be moved, be moved. Stay. Have patience, gentle Julia. Brocius, I must, where there's no remedy. When possibly I can, I will return. If you turn not, you will return the sooner. Oh. Oh. Here. Take this ring and see thou lose it not. Keep this remembrance for thy Julia's sake. Why then, we'll make exchange. Here, take you my ring. And seal the bargain with a holy kiss. Oh. Here is my hand for my true constancy. Oh. My father stays my coming. Answer not. The tide is not. Nay, not thy tide of tears. That tide will stay me longer than I should. Julia, farewell. What, gone without a word? Aye, so true love should do. It cannot speak. For truth hath better deeds than words to grace it. Proteus, sir! Aboard! You are dead, Paul! Go on! I come, I come! Alas, this parting strikes poor lovers dumb. <laughs> Nay, truth be this hour I have done my weeping. All the kind of lances have this very fault. I have received my proportion like the prodigious son, and I'm going with Sir Proteus to the Imperial's court. No, I think Crab, my dog, 
for he's the sorest natured dog that lives. My mother weeping, my father wailing, my sister crying, our maid howling, our cat wringing our hands, and all our house in a great perplexity. Yet did not this cruel hearted cur shed one tear? He is a stone, a very pebble, and has no more pity in him than a, a dog. A Jew would have wept to have seen our party. My granddad, having no eyes, look you, wept herself blind at my party. Now, I'll show you the manner of it. This shoe is my father. No, no, this uh, left shoe is my mother. Nay, that cannot be so neither. Ye yes, it is so. Yes, it is so. Uh, Yes, it, it hath a worse a soul. Uh, this shoe, with the hole in it, is my mother. And this, uh, my father. A vengeance on it, there it is. Now, sir, this staff is my sister. Look you, she is as white as a lily and as small as a wand. This hat is Nan our maid. I am the dog. No, 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 the dog is himself. And, and I am the dog. Oh, the, the dog is me, and I am myself. Aye, so, so. Now, 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 I come to my father. Father, your blessing. Now should the shoe speak a word for weeping. Now should I kiss my father. Well, he weeps on now I come to my mother. Oh, that she could speak now like a wood woman. Well, I kiss her. Why, there it is. Here's my mother's breath up and down. Now I come to my sister. Marks of moan she makes. Now the dog, all this while, sheds not a tear, nor speaks a word. See how I lay the dust with my tears. John, away, away, aboard! Thy master is shipped, and thou art to pull south to an oar. <laughs> what is the matter? Why be the snow man? Away, uh, you'll lose the tide if you tarry any longer. It is no matter if the tide were lost, for it is the unkindest tide that ever any man tied. What's the unkindest tide? Why? He that's tied here, crammed, my dog, lose the tide of the voyage and the masterless service, and the tide. Go, Cram. Hide thee, good dog. Why, man, if the river were dry, I am able to fill it with my tears. If the wind were down, I could drive the boat with my sighs. Come, come away, man. I was sent to call thee. Sir, call me what thou darest. Wilt thou go? Well, I will go. Valentine. Mistress, Sylvia. Master, superior frowns on you. Aye, boy, it's for love, not of you. Of my mistress, then. Twill good you knock him. Servant, you are sad. Indeed, lady, I seem so. Seem you that you are not? Haply I do, Sir Furio. So do counterfeits. So do you. What seem I that I am not? Why? <laughs> what instance of the contrary? Your folly. And how quote you my folly? I quote it in your jerkin. My jerkin is a doublet. Well, then, I'll double your folly. How? What? Angry, Cecilio? Do you change color? Give him leave, madam. He is a kind of chameleon <laughs> that hath more mind to feed on your blood than live in your air. You have said, sir. Aye, sir, and done too for this time. I know it well, sir. You always end ere you begin. A oh. fine volley of words, gentlemen, and quickly shut off. Sir, if you spend word for word with me, I shall make your wit bankrupt. I know it well, sir. 
You have an exchequer of words, and I think no other treasure to give your followers, for it appears by their bare liveries that they live by your bare words. No more, gentlemen, no more. Here comes my father. Now, George and Sylvia, you are hard beset. <laughs> Sir Valentine, your father is in good health. What say you to a letter from your friends of much good news? Highness, I will be thankful for any happy messenger from Pen. Know ye Don Antonio, your countryman? I, my good lord, I know the gentleman to be of worth and worthy estimation, and not without desert so well reputed. Hath he not a son? I, my good lord, a son that well deserves the honor and regard of such a father. You know him well. I know him as myself. For from our infancy we have conversed and spent our hours together. And though myself have been an idle truant, omitting the sweet benefit of time to clothe mine age with angel-like perfection, yet has Sir Proteus, for that's his name, made use and fair advantage of his days. His years but young, but his experience old. His head unmellowed, but his judgment ripe. And in a word, for far behind his worth comes all the praises that I now bestow, he is complete in feature and in mind, with all good grace to grace a gentleman. <laughs> well, sir, this gentleman is come to me with commendation from great potentates, and here he means to spend his time a while. I think there's no unwelcome news to you. Should I have wished a thing, it had been he. Welcome him, then, according to his word. Uh, Sylvia, I speak to you, and you, Sir Theorio. For Valentine, I need not cite him to it. Uh, I will send him hither to you presently. Musicians, do it again. This is the gentleman I told your ladyship had come along with me, but that his mistress Julia did hold his eyes locked in her crystal loops. The like that now she has him franchise them upon some other pawn to feel to. Nay, sure, I think she holds them prisoner still. Nay, then he should be blind. And being blind, how could he see his way to seek out you? Why, lady, love hath twenty pair of eyes. They say that love hath not an eye at all. To see such lovers, Theorio, as yourself, upon a homely object love can wink. <laughs> have done, have done. Here comes the gentleman. Dearest. Valentine, well met. Welcome, you. dear Proteus. Mistress, I beseech you, confirm his welcome with some special favor. His worth is warrant for his welcome hither, if this be he you oft have wished to hear from. Sylvia Proteus. Sweet lady, entertain him to be my fellow servant to your ladyship. Too low a mistress for so high a servant. Not so, sweet lady. But too mean a servant to have a look of such a worthy mistress. Leave off this course of disability, sweet lady. Entertain him for your servant. My duty will I boast of, nothing else. And duty never yet did want his need. Servant, you are welcome to a worthless mistress. <laughs> I'll die on him that says so but yourself. But you are welcome. That you are worthless. Lady Sylvia, the Emperor would speak with you. I wait upon his pleasure. Once more, new servant, welcome. I'll leave you to confer home affairs. When you have done, we look to hear from you. We'll both attend upon your ladyship. For now, I will attend her. Now, tell me, how do all from whence you came? Your friends are well and have them much commended. And how do yours? I left them all in hell. How does your lady... And how thrives your love? <laughs> My tales of love were wont to weary you. I know you joy not in a love discourse. I, Proteus, but that life is altered now. Oh, gentle Proteus, love's a mighty lord, and hath so humbled me, as I confess, there is no woe to his correction, nor to his service, no such joy on earth. Now no discourse, except it be of love. Now can I break my fast, dine, sup, and sleep upon the very naked name of love. Enough. I read your fortune in your eye. The Lady Sylvia, who e'en now departed, was this the idol that you worship so? Even she. And is she not a heavenly saint? No. But she is an earthly paragon. Call her divine. I will not flatter her. Oh, flatter me, for love delights in praises. When I was sick, you gave me bitter pills, and I must minister the like to you. Then speak the truth by her. 
If not divine, yet let her be a principality, sovereign to all the creatures on the earth. Except my mistress. Sweet. Except not any. Except thou wilt accept against my love. Have I not reason to prefer mine own? And I will help thee to prefer her too. She shall be dignified with this high honor. To bear my lady's train, lest the base earth shoot from her vesture chance to steal a kiss, and of so great a favor growing proud, disdain to root the summer swelling flower and make rough winter everlasting. My Valentine, what braggadism is this? Pardon me, Crutchus. All I can is nothing to her whose worth makes other worthies nothing. She is alone. Then let her alone. Not for the world. Why, man, she is mine own. And I as rich in having such a jewel as twenty seas, if all their sand were pearl, the water nectar, and the rocks pure gold. Forgive me that I do not dream on thee, because thou seest me dote upon my love. My foolish rival, that her father likes only for his possessions are so huge, is gone with her along, and I must after. For love, thou knowst, is full of jealousy. But she loves you. I... We are betrothed. Nay more. Our marriage are, with all the cunning manner of our flight determined of, how I must climb her window, the ladder made of cords, and all the means plotted and greed on for my happiness. Good Proteus, go with me to my chamber in these affairs to aid me with thy counsel. Go on before. I shall inquire you forth. I must unto the road to disembark some necessaries that I needs must use, and then I'll presently attend you. Will you make haste? I will. Even as one heat another heat expels, or as one nail by strength drives out another, so the remembrance of my former love is by a newer object quite forgotten. Is it mine eye, or Valentine's praise, her true perfection, or my false transgression that makes me reasonless to reason thus? She is fair. And so is Julia that I love, that I did love. For now my love is thawed, which like a waxen image against a fire bears no impression of the thing it was. <sighs> Methinks my zeal to Valentine is cold and that I love him not as I was wont. Oh, but I love his lady too, too much. And that's the reason I love him so little. How shall I dote on her with more advice that thus without advice begin to love her? Tis but her picture I have yet beheld, and that hath dazzled my reason's light. But when I look on her perfections, there is no reason but I shall be blind. If I can check my erring love, I will. If not, to compass her I'll use my skill. Speed, I find thee at thy old ward. Lord, by mine honesty, welcome to Millen. For one cup of sherry sack thou shalt have a thousand welcomes. But, Sarah, how did thy master part with Lady Julia? Marry, after they closed in earnest, they parted very fairly in jest. But tell me true, will it be a match? Ask my dog. If he says aye, it will. Say aye, crab. If you say no, it will. Say no, crab. If you shake his tail and say nothing, it will. Ha, ha, ha! Ah, the conclusion is, then, that it will. Thou shalt never get such a secret from me, but by a parable. It is well that I get it so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, but, Lord, how sayest thou that my master is become a notable lover? I never knew him otherwise. Then how? A notable lover, oh. as thou reportest him to be. Why, thou horse, and ass, thou mistakest me. Why, fool, I meant not thee, I meant thy master. I tell thee, my master is become a hot lover. Why, I tell thee, I care not, though he burn himself in love. If thou wilt honor the alehouse, drink with me. If not, thou art a Hebrew, a Jew, and not worth the name of a Christian. Why? Because thou wilt not have so much charity in thee as to go to ale with a Christian. Will thou drink? Most devoutly. At thy service. But look, good lord, seest thou what I see? Is that not your master, Proteus? The man himself. 
the lover to the light, <laughs> his arms entwined in a lover's knot. Hat o'er his brow, his gartering all right, and sighing deep, and talking of his love. <laughs> To leave my Julia, shall I be forsworn? To love fair Sylvia, shall I be forsworn? To wrong my friend, I shall be much forsworn. And even that power which gave me first my oath provokes me to this threefold perjury. Love bade me swear, and love bids me forswear. Oh, sweet suggesting love, if thou hast sinned, teach me thy tempted subject to excuse it. At first, I did adore a twinkling star, but now I worship a celestial sun. Unheedful vows may heedfully be broken, and he wants wit that wants resolved will to learn his wit to exchange the bad for better. Thy fi unreverent tongue to call her bad, whose sovereignty so oft thou hast preferred with twenty thousand soul-confirming oaths. I cannot leave to love, and yet I do. But there I leave to love where I should love. Julia I lose, and Valentine I lose. But if I keep them, I needs must lose myself. If I lose them, thus find I by their loss for Valentine myself. For Julia Sylvia. For well, I to myself am dearer than a friend. For love is still most precious in itself. And Sylvia, witness heaven that made her fair, shows Julia but a swarthy Ethiop. I will forget that Julia is alive, remembering that my love to her is dead. And Valentine? I'll hold an enemy, aiming at Sylvia as a sweeter friend. Well, I cannot now prove constant to myself without some treachery used to Valentine. This night, he meaneth with a corded ladder to climb celestial Sylvia's chamber window, myself in counsel his competitor. Now, presently, I'll give her father notice of their disguising and pretended flight. The Emperor, enraged, will banish Valentine, for Furio he intends shall wed his daughter. But Valentine being gone, I'll quickly cross, by some sly trick, blunt Furio's dull proceeding. Love, lend me wings to make my purpose swift, as thou hast lent me wit to plot this drift. A gentle girl, assist me. And even in kind love, I do conjure thee, who art the table wherein all my thoughts are visibly charactered and engraved, to lessen me and tell me some good means, how with my honor I may undertake a journey to my loving Proteus. Alas, the way is wearisome and long. A true devoted pilgrim is not weary to measure kingdoms with his feeble steps, much less shall she that hath love's wing to fly. And when the flight is made to one so dear, of such divine perfection, as Sir Proteus. Better forbear till Proteus make return. Oh, no, thou not, his looks are my soul's food. Pity the dearth that I have pined in by longing for that food so long a time. Didst thou but know the inly touch of love, thou wouldst as soon go kindle fire with snow. I seek to quench the fire of love with words. No, I do not seek to quench your love's hot fire, but qualify the fire's extreme rage, lest it should uh, burn above the bounds of reach. The more thou damnest it up, the more it burns. The current that with gentle murmur glides, thou knowest being stopped impatiently doth rage. But when his fair course is not hindered, he makes sweet music with the enameled stones, giving a gentle kiss to every sedge he overtaketh in his pilgrimage. And so by many winding nooks he strays with willing sport to the wild ocean. 
Then let me go and hinder not my call. I'll be as patient as a gentle stream and make pastime of each weary step till the last step have brought me to my love. And there I'll rest as after much turmoil a blessed soul doth in Elysium. But in what habit will you go along? Well, not like a woman. For I would prevent the loose encounters of lascivious men. Gentle Lucetta, fit me with such weeds as may beseem some well-reputed page. Some well-reputed page? A Sebastian, by name. Yes. Why, then your ladyship must cut your hair. No, girl, I'll knit it up in silken strings with twenty odd conceited true love knots. To be fantastic may become a youth of greater time than I shall show to be. <laughs> what fashion, madam, should I make your breeches? That fits well as Tell me, good my lord, what compass will you wear your farthingale? <laughs> Why, even what fashions thou best likes, be Lucetta. You must needs have them with a compiece, madam. Out, out, Lucetta. That will be ill favour. A round hose, madam, now is not worth a pin unless you have a compiece and six pins. Lucetta, no. thou love me. Let me have what thou thinks meet and is most manly. But tell me, wench. How will the world repute me for undertaking so unsteady a journey? I fear me it will make me scandalized. If you think so, then stay at home. Nay, go not. That I will not. Then never dream on infamy, but go. If Proteus like your journey when you come, no matter who's displeased when you are gone, I fear me he will scarce be pleased with all. That is the least Lucetta of my fear. A thousand oaths, an ocean of his tears. And instances of infinite of love warrant me welcome to my Proteus. All oaths are servants to deceitful men, base men that use them to so base effect. But truer stars did govern Proteus' birth. His words are bonds, his oaths are oracles, his love sincere, his thoughts immaculate, his tears pure messengers sent from his heart, his heart as far from fraud as heaven from earth. Thank heaven he proves so when you come to him. Now, as thou lovest me, do him not that wrong to bear a hard opinion of his truth. Only deserve my love by loving him. And presently, go with me to my chamber, to take a note of what I stand in need of, to furnish me upon my longing journey. All that is mine I leave at thy dispose, my goods, my land, my reputation. Only in you thereof dispatch me hence. Oh, come answer not, but to it presently. I am impatient of my carrion. Now, tell me, Proteus, what's your will with me? My gracious lord, that which I would discover, the law of friendship bids me to conceal. But when I call to mind your gracious favors done to me, undeserving as I am, my duty pricks me on to utter that which else no worldly good should draw from me. No worthy prince of Valentine, my friend, this night intends to steal away your daughter. Myself am one made privy to the plot. I know you have determined to bestow her on Thurio, whom your gentle daughter hates, and should she thus be stolen away from you, it would be much vexation to your age. Thus, for my duty's sake, I rather choose to cross my friend in his intended drift than by concealing it, heap on your head a pack of sorrows which would press you down, being unprevented to your timeless grave. Proteus, I thank thee for thine honest care, which to requite, command me while I live. This love of theirs myself have often seen, Aptly when they have judged me fast asleep, and oftentimes have purposed to forbid Sir Valentine her company and my court. But fearing lest my jealous aim might err, and so unworthily disgrace the man, a rashness that I ever yet have shunned, I gave him gentle looks, thereby to find that which thyself hast now disclosed to me. And that thou mayst perceive my fear of this, knowing that tender youth is soon suggested, I nightly lodge her 
in an upper tower, the key whereof myself have ever kept, and thence she cannot be conveyed away. No, noble lord, they have devised a mean how he her chamber window will ascend, and with a corded ladder fetch her down, which to procure even now he is gone. At the lane's end, without the palace gate, in the next hour you may discover him. Oh, but, uh, good my lord, do it so cunningly that my discovery be not aimed at. For love of you, not hate unto my friend, hath made me publisher of his pretense. Upon mine honor, he shall never know that I had any light from thee of this. Adieu, my lord. Stay not. Or you will miss him. Sir Valentine, whither away so fast? Uh, but please it, your grace. Uh, there is a messenger that stays to bear my letters to my friend, and I am going to deliver them. Be they of much import? This tenor of them doth but signify my health and happy being at your court. Nay, then, no matter. Stay with me a while. I am to break with thee of some affairs that touch me near, wherein thou must be secret. It is not unknown to thee that I have sought to match my friend Sir Thurio to my daughter. I, I know it well, my lord. And sure, the match were rich and honorable. Hmm. Besides, the gentleman is full of virtue, bounty, worth, and qualities beseeming such a wife as your fair daughter. Cannot your grace win her to fancy him? No, trust me. She is peevish, sullen, fraud, proud, disobedient, stubborn, lacking duty. Neither regarding that she is my child, nor fearing me as if I were her father. And, may I say to thee, this pride of hers, upon advice, hath drawn my love from her. And where I thought the remnant of mine age should have been cherished by her childlike duty, I now am full resolved to take a wife and turn her out. So who will take her in? Then let her beauty be her wedding dower. For me and my possessions she esteems not. What would your grace have me to do in this? There is a lady in Verona here whom I affect, but she is nice and coy, and naught esteems my aged eloquence. Now, therefore, would I have thee to my tutor, for long agone I have forgot to court. Besides, the fashion of the time is changed. How and which way I may bestow myself to be regarded in her sun-bright eye? Win her with gifts, if she respect not words. Dumb jewels often in their silent kind, more than quick words to move a woman's mind. But she did scorn a present that I sent her. A woman sometimes scorns what best contents her. Send her another, never give her awe, for scorn at first makes after love the more. If she do frown, tis not in hate of you, but rather to beget more love in you. If she do chide, tis not to have you gone, for why, the fools are mad if left alone. Take no repulse, whatever she doth say, for get you gone, she doth not mean away. Flatter and praise, commend, extol their graces, though ne'er so black say they have angels' faces. The man that hath a tongue, I say, is no man, if with his tongue he cannot win a woman. But she, I mean, is promised by her friends unto a youthful gentleman of worth, and kept severely from resort of men, that no man hath access by day to her. Why, then, I would resort to her by night. Ay, but the doors be locked and keys kept safe, that no man hath recourse to her by night. What lets but one may enter at her window? Her chamber is a lock. Far from the ground, and built so shelving that one cannot climb it without apparent hazard of his life. Why then, a ladder quaintly made of cords to cast up with a pair of anchoring hooks would serve to scale another hero's tower, so bold Leander would adventure it. Now, as thou art a gentleman of blood, advise me where I may have such a ladder. 
When would you use it? Pray, sir, tell me that. This very night. For love is like a child that longs for everything that he can come by. By seven o'clock, I'll get you such a ladder. But hark thee, I will go to her alone. How shall I best convey the ladder thither? It will be light, my lord, that you may bear it under a cloak that is of any length. A cloak? As long as thine will serve the turn? <laughs> Aye, good my lord. Then let me see thy cloak. I'll get me one of such another length. <laughs> Why, any cloak will serve the turn, my lord. How shall I fashion me to wear a cloak? I pray thee, let me feel thy cloak upon thee. My lord. Ah. What letter is the same? What's here? To Sylvia. And here an engine fit for my proceeding. I'll be so bold to break the seal for once. My thoughts do harbor with my Sylvia nightly, and slaves they are to me that send them flying. Oh, could their master come and go as lightly, himself would lodge where senseless they are lying. My herald thoughts in thy pure bosom rest them, while I, their king, that thither them importune, do curse the grace that with such grace hath blessed them, because myself do want my servant's fortune. I curse myself, for they are sent by me, that they should harbor where their lord would be. What's here? Sylvia, this night I will enfranchise thee. Tis so. My lord. And here's the ladder for the purpose. Why, Phaeton, for thou art mere up, son. Wilt thou aspire to guide the heavenly car, and with thy darling folly burn the world? Wilt thou reach stars because they shine on thee? Go, base intruder! Overweening slave, bestow thy fawning smiles on equal mates, and think my patience more than thy desert is privilege for thy departure hence. Thank me for this more than for all the favors which all too much I have bestowed on thee. But if thou linger in my territories longer than swiftest expedition will give thee time to leave our loyal court, by heaven! My wrath shall far exceed the love I ever bore my daughter or thyself. Be gone. I will not hear thy vain excuse. But as thou lovest thy life, make speed from hence. And why not death rather than living torment? To die is to be banished from myself. And Sylvia is myself, banished from her is self from self, a deadly banishment. What light is light if Sylvia be not seen? What joy is joy if Sylvia be not by? Unless it be to think that she is by and feed upon the shadow of perfection. Except I be by Sylvia in the night, there is no music in the nightingale. Unless I look on Sylvia in the day, there is no day for me to look upon. She is my essence, and I leave to be, if I be not by her fair influence, fostered, illumined, cherished, kept alive. I fly not death to fly his deadly doom. Tarry I here, I but attend on death. But fly I hence, I fly away from life. So ho, so ho! What seest thou? Him we go to find. There's not a hair on his head, but tis a valentine. Valentine? No. Who then? His spirit? Neither. What then? Nothing. Can nothing speak? Master, shall I strike? Who wouldst thou strike? Nothing. Still and forbear. Why, sir, I'll strike nothing, I pray you. Sir, I say forbear. Friend Valentine, a word. My ears are stopped and cannot hear good news. So much of bad already hath possessed them. Then in dumb silence will I bury mine. For they are harsh, untunable, and bad. 
Is Sylvia dead? No, Valentine. No, Valentine indeed, for sacred Sylvia. Had she forsworn me? No, Valentine. No, Valentine, if Sylvia have forsworn me. What is your news? Sir, there is a proclamation that you are banished. That thou art banished? Oh, that's the news. From hence, from Sylvia, and from me, thy friend. Oh, I have fed upon this woe already, and now excess of it will make me surfeit. Doth Sylvia know that I am banished? Aye, aye. And she hath offered to the doom, which unreversed stands in effectual force, a sea of melting pearl which some call tears. Those at her father's churlish feet she tendered. With them, upon her knees, her humble self, wringing her hands, whose whiteness so became them, as if but now they waxed pale for woe. But neither bended knees, pure hands held up, sad sighs, deep groans, nor silver-shedding tears could penetrate her uncompassionate sire. But Valentine, if he be tame, must die. Besides, her intercession chafed him so when she for thy repeal was suppliant that to close prison he commanded her with many bitter threats of biding there. No more. Unless the next word that thou speak'st have some malignant power upon my life. If so, I pray thee, breathe it in mine ear as ending anthem of my endless dollar. Cease to lament for that thou canst not help. And study help for that which thou lamentest. Time is the nurse and breeder of all good. Here, if thou stay, thou canst not see thy love. Besides, thy staying will abridge thy life. Hope is a lover's staff. Walk hence with that and manage it against despairing thoughts. But thy letters may be here, though thou art hence, which, being writ to me, shall be delivered even in the milk-white bosom of thy love. The time now serves not to expostulate. Come, I'll convey thee through the city gate, and ere I part with thee, confer at large of all that may concern thy love affairs. As thou lovest Sylvia, though not for thyself, regard thy danger and along with me. I pray thee, Launce, and if thou see my man speed, bid him make haste and meet me at the north gate. Go, Sarah, find him out. Come, Valentine. Oh, my dear Sylvia. Hapless Valentine. I am but a fool, look you. And yet I have the wit to think my master is a kind of a knave. But that's all one. If he be but one knave. Down, crab, down. He lives not now that knows me to be in love. Yet I am in love. But a team of horse shall not pluck that from me. Nor who tis I love. Yet tis a woman. A what woman? I will not tell myself. Yet tis a milkmaid. Yet tis not a maid. For she has had gossips. Yet tis a maid. For she is her master's maid, and serves for wages. She hath more qualities than a water spaniel, which is much in a bear, Christian. Here is the catalogue of her condition. In primis, she can fetch and carry. Why, a horse can do no more. Nay, a horse cannot fetch, but only carry. Therefore, is she better than a jade? Item, she can milk. Look you, a sweet virtue in a maid with clean hands. Oh no, Signor Launce, what news with your master ship? With my master ship? Why, tis at sea. Oh, well, your old vice still mistake the word. What news then in your paper? The blackest news that ever thou heardest. Why, man, how black? Why, as black as ink. <laughs> Let me read that. Fie on thee, Joel's head, thou canst not read. Well, liest, I can. I will try thee. Tell me this. Who begot thee? Marry the son of my grandfather. Oh, illiterate loiterer. 
It was the son of thy grandmother. <laughs> this proves thou canst not read. Come, fool, come. Try me in thy paper. There. And St. Nicholas be thy speed. <clears throat> Imprimis. <laughs> she can milk. Aye, that she can. Item. She brews good ale. And thereof comes the proverb, blessing of your heart, you brew good ale. Item, she can sew. That's as much to say. Can she sew? Item, she hath many nameless virtues. That's as much to say, bastard virtues. That indeed know not their fathers, and therefore have no names. Here follow her vices. Close at the heels of her virtue. Item, she is not to be kissed fasting in respect of her breath. Well, uh, that fault may be mended with a breakfast. Read on. Item, she hath a sweet mouth. That makes amends for her sour breath. Ha <laughs> ha. Item, she doth talk in her sleep. It's no matter for that, so she sleep not in her talk. Item, she is slow in words. Oh, fill in that set this down among her vices. To be slow in words is a woman's only virtue. I pray thee, out with it and place it for her chief virtue. Item, she hath no teeth. I care not for that neither, because I love cross. <laughs> Item, she is cursed. Well, the best is, she hath no teeth to bite. <laughs> Item, she will often praise her liquor. If her liquor be good, she shall. If she will not, I will. For good things should be praised. Item, she is too liberal. Of her tongue, she cannot be. For that's written down, she is slow of. Of her purse, she shall not. For that I'll keep shut. Now, of another thing she may, uh -huh. and that I cannot help. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, proceed. <clears throat> Item, she hath more hair than wit, and more faults than hairs, and more wealth than faults. Stop there, I'll have her. She was mine, and not mine. Twice or thrice in that last article. Rehearse that once more. Item. She hath more hair than wit. More hair than wit. It may be. I'll prove it. The cover of the salt hides the salt. And therefore it is more than the salt. Eh? The hair that covers the wit is more than the wit. For the greater hides the less. Ah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's next? Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And, uh... And more faults than hair. That's monstrous. Oh, that that were out. And more wealth than fault. Oh, why? That word makes the faults gracious. Well, I'll have her. And speed. Mm -hmm. If it be a match. Uh -huh. As nothing is impossible. <laughs> what then? Why? Then will I tell thee mm -hmm. that thy master stays for thee at the north gate. And must I go to him? No, must run to him. For thou hast stayed so long that going will scarce serve the turn. Why didst thou not tell me sooner? Oh, pox on your <clears throat> love letter. <laughs> and now will he be swinged for reading my letter. And a mannerly slave that will thrust himself into secrets. Come, grab. I'll after to rejoice in his correction. The fury, oh, fear not, but that she will love you. Now Valentine is banished from her sight. Since his exile, she hath despised me most, forsworn my company, and railed at me that I am desperate of obtaining her. This weak impress of love is a figure trenched in ice, which with an hour's heat dissolves to water and doth lose his form. A little time will melt her frozen thoughts, and worthless Valentine shall be forgot. Uh, tell me, Sir Proteus, is your countryman, according to our proclamation, gone? Gone, Imperial Lord. My daughter takes his going grievously. A little time, my lord, will kill that grief. Oh, but so you... I believe, but Theorio thinks not so. Proteus, the good conceit I hold of thee, for thou hast shown some sign of good desert, makes me the better to confer with thee. Longer than I prove loyal to your grace, let me not live to look upon your grace. 
Thou knowst how willingly I would effect the match between Sir Thurio and my daughter. I do, my lord. And also I think thou art not ignorant how she opposes her against my will. She did, my lord, when Valentine was here. Aye, and perversely she perseveres so. What might we do to make the girl forget the love of Valentine and love Sir Thurio? The best way is to slander Valentine with falsehood, cowardice, and poor descent. Three things that women highly hold in hate. Aye, but she'll think that it is spoken hate. Aye, if his enemy deliver it. Therefore, it must with circumstance be spoken by one whom she esteemeth as his friend. Then... You must undertake to slander him. That, my lord, I shall be loath to do. Where your good word cannot advantage him, your slander never can endamage him. Therefore, the office is indifferent, being entreated to it by your friend. You have prevailed, my lord. Hmm. If I can do it by oath that I can speak in his dispraise, she shall not long continue love to him. But say this wean her love from Valentine, it follows not that she will love Sir Thurio. Therefore, as you unwind her love from him, lest it should ravel and be good to none, you must provide to bottom it on me, no. which must be done by praising me as much as you in worth dispraise Sir Valentine. And, Proteus, we dare trust you in this kind, because we know on Valentine's report... You are already love's firm votary, and cannot soon revolt and change your mind. Upon this warrant shall you have access where you with Sylvia may confer at large. For she is lumpish, heavy, melancholy, and for your friend's sake will be glad of you. Where you may temper her by your persuasion to hate young Valentine and love my friend. As much as I can do, I will effect. But you, Sir Thurio, are not sharp enough. Oh. You must lay lime to tangle her desires by wailful sonnets whose composed rhymes should be full fraught with serviceable vows. Aye, much is the force of heaven-bred poesy. Say that upon the altar of her beauty... You sacrifice your tears, your sighs, your heart, right till your ink be dry, and with your tears moist it again, and frame some feeling line that may discover such integrity. For Orpheus' lute was strung with poet's sinews, whose golden touch could soften steel and stones, make tigers tame, and huge leviathans forsake unsounded deeps to dance on sands. After your dire lamenting elegies, visit by night your lady's chamber window with some sweet consort to their instruments tune a deploring dump. The night's dead silence will well become such sweet complaining grievance. This, or else nothing, will inherit her. This discipline shows thou hast been in love. And thy advice this night I'll put in practice. Therefore, sweet Proteus, my direction giver, let us into the city presently to sort some gentleman well skilled in music. I have a sonnet that will serve the turn to give the onset to thy good advice. About it, gentlemen, we'll wait upon your grace till after supper and afterward determine our proceedings. Even now about it, I will pardon you. Sword the game's afoot. Pray it be some man of place, heavy of purse, with velvet cloak and well stored wallet, or friar fat with poor man's tithe, or usurer portering of his money bags. <laughs> they turn into the lane that leads them here. A single lord, well mounted, and his man. There's rounds for taking and ransom to follow. String up your bows, but bend them not. Stand close. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now they come near. I'll be back behind them. You front them here. You take their bridles. Huh? No! Stand, sir, and throw us that you have about ye. If not, we'll make you sit and rifle ye. Sure, we are undone. These are the villains that all the travelers do fear so much. My friend, that's not so, sir. We are your enemies. Peace, we'll hear him. Aye, by my beard, will we, for he's a proper man. Then, then know that I have little wealth to lose. A man I am crossed with adversity. My riches are the poor habiliments of which, if you should here disfurnish me, you take the sum and substance that I have. Whither travel you? To Verona. Whence came you? From Milan. Have you long sojourned there? Some sixteen months and longer might have stayed if crooked fortune had not thwarted me. What, were you banished then? I was. For what offense? For that which now torments me to rehearse. I killed a man whose death I much repent. But yet I slew him manfully in fight without false vantage or bare treachery. Why, well, ne'er repented if we're done so. But were you banished for so small a fault? I was, and held me glad of such a doom. Have you the tongues? My youthful travel therein made me happy, or else I often had been miserable. By the bare scalp of Robin Hood's fat friar, this fellow were a king for our wild faction. We'll have him. Sir, is a word. Master be one of them. It's an honorable kind of thing. Peace, villain. Tell us this. Have you anything to take to? Nothing but my fortune. Know then that some of us are gentlemen. Myself was from Verona banished for practicing to steal away a lady, an heir, and near allied unto the duke. And I from Mantua for a gentleman who in my mood I stabbed unto the heart. And I for such like petty crimes as these. But to the purpose. For we cite our faults that they may hold excused our lawless lies. And partly, seeing you are beautified with goodly shape, and by your own report a linguist, and a man of such perfection as we do in our quality much worse. Indeed, because you are a banished man, therefore, above the rest, we party to you. Are you content to be our general? To make a virtue of necessity, and live as we do in this wilderness? What sayst thou? Wilt thou be of our consort? Say I, and be the captain of us all. We'll do thee homage and be ruled by thee, love thee as our commander and our king. But if thou scorn our courtesy, thou diest. Thou shalt not live to brag what we have offered. I take your offer and will live with you. Ah. Provided that you do no outrages on silly women or poor passengers. No, we detest such vile base practices. Come, go with us. We'll bring thee to our cruise and show thee all the treasure we have got. Which... With ourselves, all rest at thy dispose. Already have I been forced to Valentine, and now I must be as unjust to Thurio. Under the color of commending him, I have access my own love to prefer. But Sylvia is too fair, too true, too holy to be corrupted with my worthless gifts. When I protest true loyalty to her, she twits me with my falsehood to my friend. When to her beauty I commend my vows, she bids me think how I have been forsworn in breaking faith with Julia, whom I loved. And notwithstanding all her sudden quips, the least whereof would quell a lover's hope, yet spaniel-like, the more she spurns my love, the more it grows and fawneth on her still. But here comes Thurio. Now must we to her window and give some evening music to her ear. Oh, how now, Sir Proteus? Are you crept up before us? Aye, gentle Thurio, for you know that love will creep in service where it cannot go. Aye, but I hope, sir, that you love not here. Sir, but I do, or else I would be hence. Who? Sylvia. Aye. Sylvia, for your sake. <laughs> I thank you for your own. Now, gentlemen, let's tune and do it lustily a while. No, my young guest, methinks you're Ali Collie. I pray you, what is it? Marry mine host because I cannot be merry. Come, we'll have you merry. I'll bring you away for your music and see the gentleman you asked for. Shall I hear him speak? Aye, that you shall. That will be music. Hark! Hark! Is he among the musicians? Aye. But peace. Let's hear him. The hands 
such grace did lend her that she might admire and be. Mistake. The musician likes me not. Why, my pretty you? He plays false, father. Oh, heard it you on the strings? Oh, so, but yet so false that he grieves my very heart strings. Oh, you have a quick ear. I, I would, I would death. It makes me have a slow heart. Oh, I perceive your your delight not in music. Not a whit when it jars so. Ah, what a fine change is in the music. I. That change is the spice. You would have him play always but one thing. I would always have one play but one thing. But Harry, does this approach you that we talk on often resort unto this gentleman? I tell you what Lance's man told me. He loved her out of all nick. Where is this Lance? Going to seek his dog, which tomorrow, by his master's command, he must carry for a present to his lady. Oh, Stand aside. The company passed. Sir Thurio, fear not you. I will so plead that you shall say my cunning drift excels. Where meet we? At St. Gregory's Well. Farewell. Madam, good evening to your ladyship. I thank you for your music, gentlemen. Who is that that spake? One lady, if you knew his pure heart's truth, you would quickly learn to know him by his voice. Sir Proteus, as I take it. Sir Proteus, gentle lady, and your servant. What's your will? That I may compass yours. You have your wish. My will is even this, that presently you hie you home to bed. Thou subtle, perjured, false, disloyal man, thinkst thou that I am so shallow, so conceitless, to be seduced by thy flattery that hast deceived so many with thy vows? Return, return, and make thy love amends. For me, by this pale queen of night, I swear, I am so far from granting thy request that I despise thee for thy wrongful suit. And by and by intend to chide myself, even for this time I spend in talking to thee. I grant, sweet love, that I did love a lady, but she is dead. Twas false if I should speak it, for I am sure she is not buried. Say that she be, yet Valentine, thy friend, survives. To whom thyself art witness, I am betrothed, 
And art thou not ashamed to wrong him with thy importunity? I likewise hear that Valentine is dead. And so suppose am I, for in his grave assure thyself my love is buried. Sweet lady, let me rake it from the earth. Go to thy lady's grave, call her love then, or at the least in her sepulchre thine. He heard not that. Madam, if your heart be so obdurate, vouchsafe me yet your picture for my love. The picture that is hanging in your chamber. To that I'll speak. To that I'll sigh and weep. For since the substance of your perfect self is else devoted, I am but a shadow. And to your shadow will I make true love. If to a substance you would sure deceive it, and make it but a shadow as I am. I am very loath to be your idol, sir. But since your falsehood shall become you well to worship shadows and adore false shapes, send to me in the morning, and I'll send it. And so, good rest. As wretches have o'er night that wait for execution in the morn. Host, will you go? <laughs> By my Aladum, I was fast asleep. Pray you well, I suppose you. Marry at my house. Trust me. I think she's almost dead. Not so. But it hath been the longest night that e'er I watched, and the most heavy. This is the aunt that Madame Sylvia entreated me to call and know her mind, that some great matter she'd employ me in. Madam? Madam? Who calls? Your servant and your friend, one that attends your ladyship's command. Sir Eglamour, a thousand times good morrow. As many worthy lady to yourself. According to your ladyship's impose, I am thus early come to know what service it is your pleasure to command me in. Oh, Eglamour, thou art a gentleman. Oh. Think not, I flatter, for I swear I do not. Valiant, wise, remorseful, well accomplished. Thou art not ignorant what dear good will I bear unto the banished Valentine, nor how my father would enforce me marry vain Furio, whom my very soul abhors. Thyself hast loved, and I have heard thee say no grief did ever come so near thy heart as when thy lady and thy true love died, upon whose grave thou vowedst pure chastity. Sir Eglamour, I would to Valentine. To Mantua, where I hear he makes abode, and for the ways are dangerous to pass, I do desire thy worthy company, upon whose face and honour I repose. Madam. Urge not my father's anger, Eglamour, but think upon my grief, a lady's grief, and on the justice of my flying hence, to keep me from a most unholy match, which heaven and fortune still rewards with plagues. I do desire thee even from a heart as full of sorrows as the sea of sand, to bear me company and go with me. If not, to hide what I have said to thee, that I may venture to depart alone. Madam, I pity much your grievances, which since I know they virtuously are placed, I give consent to go along with you, wrecking as little what betided me, as much I wish all good, the fortune you. When will you go? This evening coming. Where shall I meet you? At Friar Patrick's cell, where I intend holy confession. I will not fail, your ladyship. Good morrow. Gentle lady. Good morrow, kind Sir Eglamour. When a man's servant shall play the cur with him, look you, it goes hard. One that I brought up of a puppy. One that I saved from drowning. When three or four of his blind brothers and sisters went to it. I have taught him, even as one would say, precisely thus I would teach a dog. I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mistress Sylvia from my master. And I came no sooner into the dining chamber 
But he steps me to her trencher and steals her cape on black. <laughs> oh, tis a foul thing when a cur cannot keep himself in all companies. I would have, as one should say, one that takes upon him to be a dog indeed. To be, as it were, a dog at all things. If I had not had more wit than he, to take a fault upon me that he did, I think verily he had been hanged for it. For sure as I live, he had suffered for it. You shall judge. He thrusts me himself into the company of three or four gentlemanlike dogs under the Duke's table. <laughs> he had not been there, bless the mark, a pissing while, but all the chamber smelt him. Out with the dog, says one. What a cur is that, says another. Whip him out, says a third. Hang him up, says the Duke. I, having been acquainted with the smell before, knew it was crab, and goes me to the fellow that whips the dogs. Friend, quoth I, you mean to whip the dog? I marry, I do, quoth he. Uh, you do him more wrong, quoth I. Uh, Twas I uh, did the thing you wot of. He makes no more ado, but whips me out of the chamber. How many masters would do this for his servant? <coughs> Nay, I'll be sworn, I have sat in the stocks for puddings he has stolen. Otherwise, he had been executed. I have stood on the pillory for geese he has killed. Otherwise, he had suffered for it. Thou thinkst not of this now. Nay, I remember the trick you served me when I took my leave of Madame Sylvia. Did not I bid thee mark me and do as I do? When didst thou see me heave up my leg and make water against a gentlewoman's farthingale? Didst thou ever see me do such a trick? Sebastian is thy name? I like thee well, and will employ thee in some service presently. In what you please. I'll do what I can. I hope thou wilt. How now, you horse and peasant? Where have you been these two days loitering? Marry, sir, I carried Mistress Sylvia the dog you bade me. And what says she to my little jewel? Marry, she says your dog was a cur, and tells you currish thanks is good enough for such a present. But she received my dog. No, indeed. Did she not? Here have I brought him back again. What? Didst thou offer her this from me? Aye, sir. The other squirrel was stolen from me by the hangman boys in the marketplace. Oh. And then I offered her mine own, who is a dog as big as ten of yours, and therefore the gift the greater. Go get thee hence and find my dog again, or ne'er return again to my sight. Away, I say. My crab the good dog. Stay out to vex me here. <laughs> Sebastian, I have entertained thee partly that I have need of such a youth that can with some discretion do my business, for it is no trusting to yon foolish lout, but chiefly for thy face and thy behavior, which, if my augury deceive me not, witness good bringing up, fortune, and truth. Therefore know thou, for this I entertain thee. Go presently and take this ring with thee, and deliver it to Madame Sylvia. She loved me well, delivered it to me. It seems you love not her to leave her token. She's dead, belike. Not so. I think she lives. Alas. Why dost thou cry alas? I cannot choose but pity her. Wherefore shouldst thou pity her? Because methinks that she loved you as well as you do love your lady, Sylvia. She dreams on him that has forgot her love. You dote on her that cares not for your love. Tis pity love should be so contrary. And thinking on it makes me cry alas. Well, give her that ring and therewithal this letter. Tell my lady I claim the promise for her heavenly picture. Your message done, hie home unto my chamber, where you shall find me sad and solitary. How many women would do such a message? Alas, poor Proteus. 
Thou hast entertained the fox to be the shepherd of thy lamb. Alas, poor fool. Why do I pity him that with his very heart despises me? Because he loves her, he despises me. Because I love him, I must pity him. This ring, I have him when he parted from me. To bind him to remember my goodwill. And now am I, unhappy messenger, to plead for that which I would not obtain, to carry that which I would have refused, to praise his faith which I would have dispraised. I am my master's true confirmed love, but cannot be true servant to my master unless I prove false traitor to myself. Yet will I woo for him, but yet so coldly, as heaven it knows, I would not have him be. Gentlewoman, good day. I pray you be my means and bring me where to speak to Madam Sylvia. What would you with her if that I be she? If you be she, I do entreat your patience to hear me speak the message I am sent on. From whom? From my master's approaches, madam. Oh, he sends you for a picture. Aye, madam. Go. Give your master this. Tell him from me, one Julia that his changing thoughts forget would better fit his chamber than this shadow. Madam, please you to peruse this letter. Oh, pardon me, madam. I have unadvised delivered you a paper that I should not. This is the letter to your ladyship. I pray thee, let me look on that again. It may not be. Good madam, pardon me. There, hold. I will not look upon your master's lines. I know they are stuffed with protestations and full of new found oaths, which he will break as easily as I do tear his paper. Madam, he sends your ladyship this ring. The more shame for him that he sends it me. For I have heard him say a thousand times his Julia gave it him at his departure. Though his false finger have profaned the ring, mine shall not do his Julia so much wrong. She thanks you. What so, sir? I thank you, madam, that you tender her. For gentlewoman, my master wrongs her much. Dost thou know her? Almost as well as I do know myself. To think upon her woes, I do protest that I have wept a hundred several times. Belike she thinks that Proteus hath forsook her. I think she does. And that's her cause of sorrow. Is she not passing fair? She hath been fairer, madam, than she is, when she did think my master loved her well. She in my judgment, was as fair as you. But since she did neglect her looking-glass and threw her sun-expelling mask away, the air has starved the roses in her cheeks and pinched the lily tincture of her face. And now she has become as black as I. How tall was she? About my stature. For at Pentecost, when all our pageants of the delight were played, our youth got me to play the woman's part, and I was trimmed in Madame Julia's gown which served me as fit by all men's judgment as if a garment had been made for me. Ever I know she's about my heart. And at that time I made her weep a good. For I did play a lamentable part. Madam, it was Ariadne passioning for Theseus' perjury and unjust flight, which I so lively acted with my tears, that my poor mistress moved therewithal, wept bitterly. And would I might be dead, if I in thought felt not her very sorrow. She is beholding to thee, gentle youth. Alas, poor lady, desolate and left, I weep myself to think upon thy words. Here, youth, there is my purse. I give thee this for thy sweet mistress' sake, because thou lovest her. Farewell, good Sebastian. And she shall thank you for today you know her. A virtuous gentlewoman, mild and beautiful. I hope my master's suit will be but cold, since she respects my mistress' love so much. Alas, how love can trifle with itself. Here is her picture. Let me see. I think if I had such a tire, this face of mine were full as lovely as is this of hers. And yet the painter flattered her a little, unless I flatter with myself too much. Her hair is auburn, 
Mine is perfect yellow. If that be all the difference in his love, I'll get me such a colored periwig. Her eyes are gray as glass, and so are mine. I put her forehead low, and mine's as high. What should it be that he respects in her, but I can make respected in myself, if this fond love were not a blinded God? Come, shadow, come, and take this shadow up, for tis thy rival. O oh, thou senseless form, thou shalt be worshipped, kissed, loved, and adored. And were there sense in his idolatry, my substance should be statue in thy stead. I'll use thee kindly for thy mistress' sake that used me so. Or else, by Jove, I vow, I should have scratched out your unseeing eyes to make my master out of love with thee. The sun begins to gild the western sky. And now it is about the very hour that Sylvia at Friar Patrick's cell should meet me. She will not fail, for lovers break not hours unless it be to come before their time. So much they spur their expedition. <laughs> See where she comes. Lady, a happy evening. Amen, amen. Go on, good Egumor, out of the postern by the Abbey Wall. I fear I am attended by some spies. Fear not. The forest is not three leagues off. If we recover that, we are sure enough. Sir Proteus, what says Sylvia to my suit? Oh, sir, I find her milder than she was, and yet she takes exception at your person. What? That my leg is too long? No, that it is too little. I'll wear a boot to make it somewhat rounder. But love will not be spurred to what it loathes. What says she to my face? She says it is a fair one. Nay, then, the wanton lies. My face is black. But pearls are fair. And the old saying is, black men are pearls in beauteous ladies' eyes. It's true, such pearls have put out ladies' eyes, for I'd rather wink than look on them. How likes she my discourse? Ill when you talk of war, but well when I discourse of love and peace. But better indeed when you hold your peace. What says she to my valor? Oh, sir, she makes no doubt of that. She needs not when she knows it cowardice. What says she... To my birth, that you are well derived. True, from gentleman to a fool. Considers she my possession. Oh, I, and pities them. Wherefore? That such an ass should owe them. That they are out by lease. Here comes the duke. How now, Sir Proteus? How now, Theorio? Uh, which of you saw Sir Eglamour of late? Not I. Nor I. Saw so you my daughter? Neither. Why then? She's fled unto that peasant Valentine, and Eglamour is in her company. Oh, it is true. For Friar Lawrence met them both as he in penance wandered through the forest. Him he knew well and guessed that it was she. But being masked, he was not sure of it. Besides, she did intend confession at Patrick's cell this even, and there she was not. These likelihoods confirm her flight from hence. Therefore, I pray you, stand not to discourse, but mount you presently, and meet with me upon the rising of the mountain foot that leads towards Mantua, whither they are fled. Dispatch, sweet gentlemen, and follow me. Why, this it is to be a peevish girl that flies her fortune when it follows her. I'd after, more to be revenged on Eglamour than for the love of reckless Sylvia. And I will follow more for Sylvia's love than hate of Eglamour that goes with her. And I will follow more to cross that love than hate for Sylvia that is gone for love. Ah, come, lady, come. Ah. Most unmannerly maid and vile of men. Know that my father shall avenge me truly. Come, come, lady, be patient. We must bring you to our captain. Of course I must. A woman has no remedy. A thousand more mischances than this one have learned me how to brook this patiently. Come, bring it away. Where is the gentleman that was with her? Coward hind that leaves his lady thus. Straight to his heels he took, and without pause, being nimble-footed, he hath outrun us. But Moses and Valerius follow him. The thicket is beset. He cannot escape. Go thou with the lady to the west end of the wood. There is our captain. He will question her. Come, I must bring you to our captain's cave. Yes. Fear not. He bears an honorable mind and will not use a woman lawlessly. Oh, Valentine. 
this I endure for thee. How use doth breed a habit in a man. This shadowy desert, unfrequented woods, I better brook than flourishing peopled towns. Here can I sit alone, unseen of any, and to the nightingale's complaining notes tune my distresses and record my woes. O oh, thou that dost inhabit in my breast, leave not the mansion so long tenantless, lest growing ruinous the building fall, and leave no memory of what it was. Prepare me with thy presence, Sylvia, thou gentle nymph, cherish thy forlorn swain. Who's this comes here? Lady Sylvia. The service I have done for you, though you respect not aught that Proteus doth, to hazard life and rescue you from him that would have forced your honor and your love. Vouchsafed me for my meed, but one fair look. A smaller boon than this I cannot beg, and less than this I am sure you cannot give. How like a dream is this. I see and hear love lend me patience to forbear a while. Oh, miserable, unhappy that I am. Unhappy were you, madam, ere I came. But by my coming, I have made you happy. By thy approach, thou makes me most unhappy. And me when he approaches to your presence. Had I been seized by a hungry lion, I would have been a breakfast to the beast rather than have false Proteus rescue me. Oh, heaven be judge how I love Valentine, whose life's as tender to me as my soul. And full as much, for more there cannot be, I do detest false perjured Proteus. Therefore be gone, solicit me no more. Now what dangerous action stood it next to death would I not undergo for one calm look? Oh, tis the curse in love, and still approved, when women cannot love where they're beloved. When Proteus cannot love where he's beloved. Read over Julia's heart, thy first best love, for whose dear sake thou didst then rend thy faith into a thousand oaths, and all those oaths descended into perjury to love me. Thou hast no faith left now, unless thou dost too, and that's far worse than none. Better have none than plural faith, which is too much by one. Thou counterfeit to thy true friend. In love, who respects a friend? All men but Proteus. <sighs> Nay, if the gentle spirit of moving words can no way change you to a milder form, I'll woo you like a soldier at arm's end, and love you against the nature of love. Force ye. Oh, I'll force thee yield to my desire. Scorpion! Let go that rude, uncivil touch, thou friend of an ill fashion. Valentine. Thou common friend that's without faith or love. For such is a friend now, treacherous man. Thou hast beguiled my hopes. Not by mine eye could have persuaded me. Now I dare not say I have one friend alive. Thou wouldst disprove me. Who should be trusted now when one's right hand is perjured to the bosom? Proteus, I am sorry I must never trust thee more, but count the world a stranger for thy sake. The private wound is deepest. O oh, time most accursed amongst all foes that a friend should be the worst. My shame and guilt confirms me. Forgive me, Valentine. If hearty sorrow be a sufficient ransom for offense, I tender it here. I do as truly suffer as e'er I did commit. Then I am paid. And once again I do receive thee honest. Who by repentance is not satisfied is nor of heaven nor earth. For these are pleased. By penitence, the eternal's wrath's appeased. And that my love may appear plain and free, all that was mine in Sylvia, I give thee. Oh, me unhappy. Look to the boy. Why, boy? Why, wag, huh, now? What's the matter? Look up. Speak. Oh, good sir, my master charged me to deliver a ring to Madame Sylvia, which... 
Out of my neglect will never done. Where is that ring, boy? Here it is. This is it. How? Well, let me see. Why, this is the ring I gave to Julia. Oh, cry your mercy, sir. I have mistook. This is the ring you sent to Sylvia. But how camest thou by this ring? At my depart, I gave this unto Julia. And Julia herself did give it me. And Julia herself hath brought it hither. How? Julia? Behold her that gave aim to all thy oaths. And entertained him deeply in her heart. How oft hast thou with perjury cleft the root? O oh, Proteus, let this man's habit make thee blush. Be thou ashamed that I have took upon me such an immodest raiment, if shame live in a disguise of love. It is the lesser blot modesty finds. Women to change their shapes, the men their minds. The men their minds. It is true. Oh, heaven were man but constant, he were perfect. That one error fills him with faults, makes him run through all the sins. Inconstancy falls off that it begins. What is in Sylvia's face but I may spy more fresh in Julia's with a constant eye? Come, come, a hand from either. Let me be blessed to make this happy close. For pity, two such friends should be long foes. Bear witness, heaven. I have my wish forever. And I mine. A bride! A bride! A nobleman! A noble price for ransom! Forbear! Forbear, I say! It is the emperor! Mercy, your grace! Your grace is welcome to a man disgraced. Banished Valentine. Sir Valentine? Yonder is Sylvia, and Sylvia's mine. Curio, get back. Or else embrace thy death. Come not within the measure of my wrath. Do not name Sylvia thine. If once again Verona shall not hold thee. Here she stands. Take but possession of her with a touch. I dare thee but to breathe upon my love. <laughs> Sir Valentine, I, I care not for her, I. I hold him but a fool that will endanger his body for a girl that loves him not. I claim her not, and therefore she is thine. The more degenerate and base art thou to make such means for her as thou hast done, and leave her on such slight conditions. Now, by the honor of my ancestry, I do applaud thy spirit, Valentine, and think thee worthy of an empress love. For now I charge you on your sworn allegiance that you appear this night in court before me. I shall at leisure think, and then make known what my decree is, what my punishment. These are claws bring away, whilst I consider Wait, no more words. Away! Valentine, Proteus, fail me not. Tonight at court, all shall receive my doom. Bid the lords enter and bring in the outlaws. Presently, your grace. Know then, I here forget all former griefs, cancel all grudge, repeal thee home again, plead a new state in thy unrivaled merit, to which I thus subscribe. Sir Valentine, thou art a gentleman, and well derived. Take thou thy Sylvia, for thou hast deserved her. I thank your grace. The gift hath made me happy. I now beseech you, for your daughter's sake, 
to grant one boon that I shall ask of you. I grant it for thine own, whate'er it be. These banished men that I have kept with all are men endued with worthy qualities. Forgive them what they have committed here and let them be recalled from their exile. They are reformed, civil, full of good and fit for great employment, worthy lord. Thou hast prevailed. I pardon them oh. and thee. Oh. I dispose of them as thou knowest their deserts. Musicians, ho! We will conclude all jars with triumphs, mirth, and rare solemnity. And, gracious Lord, dare I be bold with our discourse to make your grace to smile. Mm -hmm. What think you of this page, my lord? I think the boy hath grace in him. He blushes. I warrant you, my lord, more grace than boy. What mean you by that say? Uh, please it, your grace. <laughs> Come, Proteus. It is your penance, but to hear the story of your love discover it. That done, our day of marriage shall be yours. One feast, one house, one mutual happiness. That was The Two Gentlemen of Verona by William Shakespeare.